Well, church family, believe it or not, we did not add the rooster into it. <laughs> you may not know Sastria or Paige, but you have invested deeply in both of their lives. Sastri is actually Dr. Sastri Misala. He earned a master's and a PhD from Southwestern Seminary, funded by the Nobles Scholarship that we helped coordinate. Let me tell you, my friends, it means a lot to me that you got to see Sastri here. Now, Paige, you might say, she doesn't look very Indian. That's because she isn't. She's from Amarillo. We sent her on our behalf to keep him in line. He needs Texans around him to make sure things go well. So he and, he and Paige have a beautiful, very lovely child. Joshua is his name, and they are delighted to serve in South India where Sastri is from. And that is a significant thing for me to be reminded that Christmas is not just for us here in the States. It is a reminder that Jesus came for all. And he came in a very peculiar sort of way. Now, for those of us who have walked a long time with Jesus, we don't think it peculiar anymore. We simply acknowledge that as a fact and we say, hey, that's just how Jesus came. That's the way it is. But <clears throat> when you go back through the pages of the Old Testament, you see the Messiah painted in different colors. It doesn't appear when you see him in the Old Testament that he will come like this. Oh, sure, Isaiah talks about him coming meek and mild, he coming as the birth of a virgin, him coming in a way as a suffering servant. He will come in ways that we didn't expect him. But you know, have you ever been looking for your keys with them in your hand? Have you ever roamed the house looking for your glasses to discover them on your head? Have you ever walked around looking for something that you were carrying? I won't ask you to raise your hand because chances are good. Yes, yes, that's you. You've made that mistake because you were so intent on looking for something specific you couldn't see what was obvious. Friends, I want to tell you that's why a lot of people will miss Jesus. He doesn't look like what they thought he would. He doesn't look like they thought he should, and as a result, they've missed him altogether. Joseph nearly made that mistake. When we hear the story of Joseph, and we have this morning already, it is a reminder of the humanity of those in the Christmas story. We light these candles, and rightfully so, for each one of them reminds us of a component of the Christmas story. But when we get to this one, when we get to Joseph, we get to a place where we have to grapple with the fact that these were humans with shortcomings and limitations, misunderstandings. Joseph was not immune to that. When we find his story, we find the story of one who received a visit from an angel just like Mary did. Now, if you're one who reads the Gospels regularly like I am, then you know the first 17 verses of the Gospel of Matthew are the genealogy of Jesus, presumably from our friend Joseph's side. But when it gets to verse 18, the story changes. and We find the story of Joseph writ large. It is a wonderful story and one that is very familiar to us, but I want you today to perhaps see it from a different perspective. Instead of seeing him just strictly as the father of Jesus, let's step back and see him as the recipient of grace, the recipient of an amazing, amazing gift. And so I want you to see first Joseph's act of grace. When we see Joseph, we see a young man who has a hopeful future, uh, a, a, a young man with a bright future ahead of him, a hopeful future that says, there's a place that I'm going and God has given this beautiful lady to walk with me. When he proposed to her, no doubt, no doubt there was a different set of circumstances in mind. Now we don't know any of the circumstances about how they found each other, were they betrothed from when they were young, like children, when they, that was tradition at the time. We, we don't know that, but what we do know is this, when Joseph found that she was pregnant, it changed things. See, the bride had just one job, 
really just one, one job for all of Jewish culture in that time, and really even still to this day. Be ready for your groom. That's it. That was her whole function. Be ready for your groom when he comes to call for you. You don't know when it's going to be, so be ready for the groom when he comes. That was her whole job. Oh, and by the way, don't get pregnant. Protect your dignity, protect your purity. Can I tell you today, my friends, when the conversation came that Joseph found out that she was pregnant, and oh, by the way, this is a child given to her by the Holy Spirit. Honestly now, how many of you would have been able to swallow that one? It would have been a bit difficult for you, I bet, just like it would have been for me. Wait just a minute. Don't lie to me on top of committing this sin of adultery. And that was exactly how he felt. I want you to see it in verse 9. Her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. When you read that, don't read it in the context of, okay, this is just the next part of the Christmas story. Joseph has to do that to get to the next step. I want you to see it for what it is, not just what we've made it. He was being who he was. Malcolm Gladwell is a business writer that I really love to read. I've read, written, read almost all that he's written. He wrote a book some years ago called The Tipping Point. His argument in that book is there are uh, people who are extremely proficient at what they do. And those who are proficient at what they do, generally speaking, they've spent 10,000 hours preparing to be so proficient. 10,000 hours. Wow, that's a long time. Yes. So his argument is, if you want to be really proficient at something, you better start early and get started with it as soon as possible so you can start building on that 10,000 hours. At 10,000 hours, his argument goes, get this, at 10,000 hours, it stops being something you do and instead becomes something you are. Hmm. We've seen some of this. Let me just pause here and give you an example. Doris McSparren. Let me just tell you, she is way past 10,000 hours. When she sits down at an instrument, whether it's the organ or the piano, it is incredible to me to watch just the ease with which she oozes over the keyboard. And it's infuriating to me because I wish I had that gift. Maybe I could have if I'd have invested the kind of time and energy she has. It's part of who she is. Likewise, Joseph was a just and righteous man. This moment didn't fall out of the sky. It was a moment that God had prepared him for and he had prepared himself for. Oh, friends, don't miss this part. Joseph was demonstrating an incredible gift of grace by giving her a home. But in doing so, in this hopeful future he had, it was changed in just a moment. Surely this was no ordinary child. Surely this was the child sent from the Holy Spirit. Surely, even though Joseph was unaware of what Mary had just told him, he was only aware of the lost future. Consider how awful it must have been for Mary to tell Joseph this. Consider how gracious he must have been to not declare her unjust. And, according to Mosaic law, have her stoned to death. That was within his rights. Then where would we be, right? Instead, he loved her. And he wanted nothing more than for her to be able to go her way as he would go his. Let's take something home with us, shall we? Uncertainty is the breeding ground for a lack of faith. But God's grace anchors me deep for when the waters of uncertainty rise. When things get fu fuzzy, when things get out of focus, when circumstances crash in around me, it's easy for me to feel like God has set me aside or he's just walked away altogether. Instead of feeling that, let us then 
return when those waters of uncertainty rise high and they begin to rise over our heads and we begin to wonder where is God in the midst of all of this, let us rejoice that if we've anchored deep, those waters will not overwhelm us just like they didn't our friend Joseph. Into this moment of uncertainty, into this moment when he's committing to a plan of action in verse 19, that's when God shows up, just like he always does. God shows up. And God gives Joseph a message of prophetic promise, a message that is something far different than what Joseph expected. What I love about the video that we showed a few minutes ago is the actor playing Joseph unfolds a piece of paper to be reminded of what the angel said. Do you think there was ever a moment in his life when he didn't think back to this moment right here? I think this was the defining moment of his life. I want you to see how he's, how he's described verse 20. See it in the middle of verse 20. Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. Son of David, underline that if you're one who underlines it in the Bible, and you'll see why we started the, the gospel with the genealogy. The whole point of starting the genealogy with Jesus, starting the book with the genealogy, was to paint the picture that Joseph was in line with our friend King David, and now that whole tree has grown up to this very moment when Jesus is born into the line of David. Oh, friends, rejoice with me that Jesus is the fulfillment of that promise. And rejoice with me that the word given to Joseph is not to be afraid. I've told you this before, but it bears repeating. Maybe you need to write it down somewhere for your own use. 365 times in pages of scripture, you'll find the phrase, do not fear. Many times it's just like this one. Into a moment of crisis, into a moment of uncertainty, into a moment of fear, where fear would be dragging us down. Can I tell you today, friends, fear comes for all of us. If you're expecting to not be afraid when crisis comes, then you're going to be disappointed. Fear comes for all of us. Let us rejoice, though, that we don't have to give it the final vote. When a messenger comes from God, set aside your fear and listen to him. Well, that's easier said than done, Darren. Isn't it, though? I saw a video a couple of weeks ago. This man, I don't know where he was. I couldn't find the video again to bring it to you. He was a chalk artist. And he went out to this roadside in the, 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 in the hill country, wherever he was, and he drew a picture of picture. He drew a picture on the road of a cliff as if the road dropped off. And as if the road went into the middle of this deep chasm and this great deep ravine, there was nothing changed about the road. It was consistent, but it looked different. Cue a herd of goats coming down the road. The herd of goats who can't see necessarily very well, but their eyes saw enough to cause them to say, uh-uh. They walked right up to the edge of the chalk drawing and turned around and walked away. Even with their herder standing on the other side of it, they would not come to him. Even as he tried to push them across, they would not go. Fear was simply too much for them. The problem we run into is not unlike a quote that Mark Twain offers us. Let me read it for you. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Here is the problem. Many times we think we know something really well, and when the reality is we don't know it nearly as well as we think we do. And so we allow ourselves to be deceived by our own arrogance, our own intuition, our own feelings, and we allow that to sweep us away, and we find ourselves drowning in our own fear and uncertainty when God the whole time is saying, don't be afraid, I'm here. Trust me and keep walking. Don't let fear have the final vote. You see it here in the last part of verse 20. 
Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. You'll call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Here we see Joseph stepping out in faith to adopt. Let's pause here for a moment and say adoption, a prophetic message 700 years in the making. See it in verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Hmm. It reminds me forevermore of Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those that were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons and daughters. Here, here, friends, is a picture, a simple carpenter adopting the Holy Spirit's child given to Mary. A simple carpenter stepping out in faith based on what God has said to him. A simple carpenter taking on what is the promised Messiah as his own. Here is the powerful moment into which God speaks. Let your heart then, like Joseph, be free. Maybe an angel hasn't visited you, but I've got even better news for you. What you have within you, if you are a believer in Christ, is far greater than that which Joseph had. The Holy Spirit sent by Jesus himself indwells each and every believer. The message that was brought to Joseph was a special one, but he didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling him the way you do. You might say, but I've been waiting for a sign. I've been asking the Lord for that kind of sign, Darren. God hasn't given it to me. Oh, no. He sent Jesus, didn't he? And here, 2,000 years later, his influence and power are still being felt. Can I tell you today, my friends, when God declares something to be true, it shall be so. And when Joseph is invited into this melodrama, into this new reality, into this exchange, I want to give you good news, friends, and it is good. He steps in with uncertainty and finds God waiting for him there. So will you. But Darren, I've trusted God before and he didn't do it like I thought he should have. Yeah, talk to Joseph about that too. No doubt there were whispers. No doubt there were people going around behind his back saying, hey, did you hear about Joseph? You hear about he's taking that, that woman, that girl, that girl who isn't pure? He should have had her stoned. There will always be people like that. I call them the designated againers. Whatever everybody else is for, they're again it. And they're again it because they don't necessarily have the Spirit of God in their hearts or their mouths. They speak out sometimes out of turn. And when they do, sometimes we take that as a word from the Lord. Don't take somebody's word over the word of God himself. It's a bad trade. If you do, you will find yourself disappointed for the rest of your life. Instead, let the word of God speak powerfully into your life and let it be the point on which you build, an anchor that you can draw on when things are uncertain. That brings me to what I want you to take home with you. God's word still declares his message. The question is, are you listening? Would you hear it if God spoke? Wayne Watson is a Christian music artist from years gone by. He used to do a song called, Would I Know You Now? The song, I won't sing it for you, and you'll be grateful for that. He says, would I know you now if you walked into the room? Could I spot you in a crowded room? If I saw your face, would I recognize you? I wonder, would I know you now? The obvious answer is, maybe. It's been said that we, 
that God created us in his image and we've returned the favor ever since. We've been making God into our image so it's more comfortable for us. But let me tell you today, friends, when we see Jesus for who he really is through the word of God, then we will find ourselves humble, just like Joseph. Let's bring it to a conclusion. Joseph and his mission of mercy. God has spoken, has spoken into his fear, has spoken clearly and declared his presence and his power. But that still requires Joseph to act, to do something about it. Joseph has to decide he's going to step out in faith. It's not unlike what we find in Matthew chapter 14, just a few chapters later. There, Jesus is walking on the water, and Peter sees him walking on the water and says, Lord, if it's you, call me to you. Now, you know the rest of the story. You know that Jesus has come on. And Peter steps out of the boat, something he'd never done, something he never even thought of doing, something that seemed completely absurd, and yet at Jesus' invitation, it didn't seem so bizarre. So he steps out on the water and takes a few steps. Now, you might hurry to say, ah, yes, but he sank, Darren. Yes, but he was the only one outside of Jesus who ever walked on water. Don't take from him what God gave to him. I'll say the same to you. Don't let somebody take from you what God has already given you. And if there are things that he's declared in your life to be true, and there are, then don't give them away to somebody else because they find it uncomfortable or inconvenient. Well, I don't know what those things are, Darren. Here, I want you to write a note to yourself. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14, tells you exactly who you are in Christ. And if you want to see who that is, then take time today to read those verses. It's all one sentence in Greek. We've broken it up in English into a whole bunch of sentences, but in, in Greek, Ephesians 1, 3 to 14 is one sentence. I invite you today to let that be the governing God document for your life. For our friend Joseph, when he wakes up from his dream, when he wakes up from the vision that he had, he wakes up with a new resolve, something that changed everything. And perhaps we might say he's awake for the first time. When Joseph woke up, it was with a new mission, a new purpose. He would act on what Jesus had, or the Holy Spirit had whispered into his heart. He would act on what the angel had told him. And whether he understood all of it or not, we really don't know. But we do know that it was enough for Joseph to say, yes, Lord. Reality is, when God speaks, we don't have to ask, who is it? Nor do we need to say, let me think about it. All we need to say is what Joseph said. Yes, Lord. Knowing enough only to move forward, Jesus would have a home. Joseph would protect Mary's purity and shelter her under Jewish law. The name given to them was one that would change eternity a name that changes everything. Let's talk about Jewish custom in the first century. It was customary to be given the father's name for a son. Not unusual at all. In fact, extraordinary if that didn't happen. And yet the angel was clear. Give him the name Jesus. You remember when you were naming your children do you remember how wide and deep you looked and how long you thought about it? Do you remember that? I sure do. And I remember it so clearly when we finally settled on the name that we gave him. It wasn't the one that I wanted. I still thought Drift would have been a great name for our son. Drift would. Some of you will get that later. <laughs> I've tried to encourage him to name his son that when he has a child, but... We'll see about that. He's scowling at me, so I'll move on quickly. <laughs> the name given to the baby was the one the angel commanded. Jesus, 
the one who will save from the sins of the world. A powerful name, an extraordinary name, but it's one that Joseph embraces. It's a name that he takes on and one that, given by God, links Jesus directly to him. Through Joshua of the Old Testament, the name from which Jesus is drawn, God saved his people through Jesus in the New Testament. He saves all of humanity. Let's end with this, shall we? Joseph's God-ordained mission defined his life. We don't know anything about Joseph's journey after what happens at the end of Luke 2. When Jesus is at the temple at 12 years old, that's the last time that we see Joseph. We don't know what happened to him. There's lots of theories. There's several legends. There's a whole lot of traditions. But we know this. Joseph's God-ordained mission defined his life. I'm asking you, what defines yours? Is it God-ordained or is it something that you have come up with on your own? Today, friends, you get to start a wave. Oh, no, not the kind that you see at football stadiums or baseball parks. The kind that carries momentum. You see, these big ocean waves that crash in at the sea, they don't start that way. They start rather small. And it's as they travel along that they gather momentum. And as they gather momentum, they carry other things with them. I want to ask you today, what's the wave that you're riding? Everybody's going to ride one of them. I want to ask you, what's the wave you're riding? Today, friends, I want to ask you to define what's defining you. When you look within you, you'll see it. Because all of us have that thing. What motivates you to get up in the morning? What compels you to move forward? My prayer is that it starts the same way Joseph's did, with a God-ordained mission. You might say, but Darren, I, I, I don't have such an encounter. For those of us in Christ, oh, yes, you do. Yes, indeed, you do. You'll find it in Matthew 28. Go, therefore, into all the world, teaching them to observe all the things. Make disciples as you go, baptizing them. This, friends, is your God-ordained mission, to live in the light of the glory of God, to be the witnesses that he's called you to be and to declare the goodness of God wherever you go. Friends, today, that is your mission. What are you doing with it? Maybe you've never invited Jesus into your life, and so you haven't started on that mission. Here's your chance today. We're going to stand, we're going to sing, and in just a second, you'll get the chance to come down here and talk to me. Today is your day to step out in faith. Today, will you decide that the wave is worth making, that you're worth what Jesus brought, and that Jesus' mission in your life is, like Joseph's, the defining point of your life. Pray with me, won't you? Today, Lord Jesus, we declare your goodness. It's not that that's a surprise. No, you've always been good. But today, Lord, we declare your goodness as a reminder that you, Jesus, came to bring us that through the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of Mary and, yes, Lord, in the life of Joseph. That crazy plan that you had, that you laid out for us in the Old Testament and that you brought to fruition through their lives, we still, Lord, aren't over it yet. And Lord, my prayer is we never get, the, get over it. I pray today, Lord, for those who need to respond to you. Maybe they've wandered off into the weeds and they've forgotten what you called them to do, or worse yet, forgotten who you've called them to be. I pray, Lord, you'd call us to that again. I pray, Lord, for those who need to step out in faith today for the very first time, that you'd give them the freedom to do that and come down here and talk with me. I pray for those who have had a difficult week, who are hurting, who are wounded, who are overwhelmed by fear like Joseph. Let them find in you the safe harbor that he did. 
I pray, Lord Jesus, that your wind of the Holy Spirit would flow through this place, that you would bring peace, joy, hope, life, and love. Do it here now, Lord Jesus, in this invitation time. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.